Well, Manjika, and welcome to Melbourne School of Design. My name is Dan Hill. I'm the director of the School of Design here, which is the graduate school in the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning at the University of Melbourne. Back in July, the Living Cities Forum was held here in Melbourne, and it was a fantastic day-long event with speakers from all over the world. And we actually nabbed a couple of them while they were here. Mailing Loco, an architect based in Accra in Ghana and also at Yale University and Joseph Grima, a curator and architect based out of Italy. And we paired them up with members of our faculty that we thought we could have an interesting discussion with about these questions of extraction, circular ecologies, global south politics, and culture. So they are Anoma Pierres, Patrick Kobana, Jyoti Shukla, and Alex Felsen. So the format will be, we'll hear a presentation from Mei Ling and Joseph, and then we'll go straight into a discussion with Anoma and Patrick, and then we'll swap over to Jyoti and Alex. Hope you enjoy the talk. Stay tuned for more like this from Melbourne School of Design. To start with, we're going to uh, have a presentation from Mailing Loco and then Joseph Grima. Joseph will go first. Um, and these guys were at Living Cities yesterday. And those of you that didn't see Living Cities Forum, you can still see it on the web and read all about it. But essentially, the whole day was framed around the question of materials, one way or another. And then within that, circular ecologies, circular economies, um, practices of construction and building and labor and land. Uh, and of course, underlying that, then questions of um, colonization, uh, carbonization various other <laughs> problematic words beginning with C. Um, all of those were on the table and it was an amazing array of speakers. And I was lucky enough to hear Mei Ling and Joseph in the last session where we did a, a, a wrap up, I guess, also with um, Zhu Tian Tian from Beijing of DNA architecture. But so between the three of them, they came at that question from different angles. Mei Ling's work, as you'll hear after Joseph, very much predicated on um, quite deep, I would say, investigations of materiality and looking at, uh, as we'll hear, agricultural byproducts being possible use of construction materials and waste and what that might mean in, from multiple different dimensions and how, what happens when you place that in a place like Accra in Ghana and also with her work at, at Yale at the same time. So massively interesting series of flows back and forth there. Um, and then Joseph, you will hear about very shortly, but uh, again, was much, um, as I said in our wrap up, it was kind of taking this big picture of essentially the planetary scale, then down to the actual detailed practices on the ground of what we make with, how we make it, how local those materials and processes might be. So um, based on your work in Italy and all over the place, I would say. <laughs> so I'm joined by Anoma Pieres and Patrick Kobiner from the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning, who are researchers and teachers there as well. And then, um, so we're gonna have a discussion with those guys after they introduce a bit of their work in this context. And then we're going to tag team them out in about 50 minutes and bring in uh, Jyoti Shukla, who's here, and then Alex Felsen, who some of you will know, who are other sides of the faculty as well. So bear with us with the slightly complex format if that's all right, there's the, there will be people coming and going from the stages. And thank you to James and Basil and Sarah and the team for making it work. So without further ado, I think I'm gonna hand over to Joseph and um, Joseph and Mailing will give a sort of 10 minutes or less even um, presentation about some of their work in this context, just to prime the conversation. Okay, so over to you, Joseph. Grazie, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to do my best to <clears throat> condense into 10 minutes uh, what is inevitably an incredibly complex uh, topic and, I, um, and one that doesn't really lend itself to oversimplification. But yeah. I think the point um, here, like uh, on Dan's invitation, is to take a position. Um, and I think the position that is indisputable is that we have a problem uh, collectively. I think that the architecture industry, the construction industry, is painfully aware that it is at the center of that problem. Uh, we therefore all agree that something has to change. The question is what has to change uh, and how much has to change. And I think that was really at the center of yesterday's um, discussion. Um, my um, point of departure, the point of departure of this project, non-extractive architecture, is that we operate under a certain paradigm. We are, there are certain sort of givens within our profession. Um, 
that we tend not to question. Uh, we tend not to question the holiness of a certain uh, orthodoxy which is predicated around uh, a number of principles that we take to be almost um, sort of indisputable um, and that a series of materials that are indisputable, a series of, uh, uh, you could say, um, dogmas or of um, individuals who are held up to be a model, um, especially in uh, places like this, like universities, like the models that we offer to students, to uh, those who are entering the profession, uh, is an incredibly important question. And I think um, this I'm really kind of like, I've chopped out like 80% uh, um, of the slide. So uh, I'm just gonna put the, drop this in here as a, an example of a certain paradigm of a, uh, a Western architect who uh, creates a building. I and mean, this is like one of the most incredibly beautiful and significant uh, and amazing buildings in the world. Uh, there's no question around that. Um, uh, the Palace of um, uh, Freedom. Um, and by Le Corbusier. It also represents a paradigm that is deeply problematic in uh, all sorts of ways once you start to uh, look really closely, not least because um, it uh, normalized, and I think this is the connection between these two is perhaps, um, uh, I think we're missing a few slides here, but uh, the idea of a certain, <clears throat> that certain kind of architecture can be uh, developed universally and replicated universally. It can uh, depend on a series of materials that are universal, that have a certain kind of uh, universal plasticity, uh, they actually kind of land on the ground, become problematic. And they become problematic, I mean, here it's pretty clear, urbanistically there's a problem. Um, there's a problem um, in terms of kind of the civic uh, uh, environment that is Im implied in, uh, in this sort of model, which is incidentally directly derived from uh, Le Corbusier's early 20th century um, um, and visions. Uh, but there's a problem also in terms uh, kind of like becoming very sort of uh, patients of a use at scale, a planetary scale of the materials that such a model are dependent on. Um, and in this particular case, uh, and this is just taking one example, this, it, it's, it's not about concrete or not concrete, it's about thinking about what is implied in the use of the materials that we um, choose when we scale them up um, to a certain level. So, I mean, this is just like a, making the point pretty bluntly. Um, unfortunately, I don't know why this image uh, exported in a very lo-fi uh, psychedelic uh, uh, color palette, but um, yeah. what you're looking at is <clears throat> a second order consequence of, if we take this as a certain kind of paradigm, this is a first order consequence, and the second order consequence, which is uh, the sourcing of the materials that go into concrete sand is the most widely uh, used, widely extracted material um, on planet Earth other than water, mostly widely used in the construction industry. It's a material that construction industry is deeply dependent on. It's a material that is not as widely available as we, as we think. You can't just go into the Sahara Desert and use the sand. Uh, it has to be sourced from riverbeds in order to have the kind of characteristics that are needed for structural integrity. Uh, and the consequences of extracting that at scale are erosion, uh, and that erosion typically does not affect. Here we have already a kind of an indication of the problems of um, all sorts of uh, deep war um, and um, uh, things that you would never... All of this is somehow implied in a certain idea of architecture we, that we hold up as, the, as, as a paradigm, as, a, as, as something to be um, upheld by our institutions, by our academia, and so on. Uh, and of course, the, the Barcelona Pavilion by Mies van Roo is a, a fantastic example of that, how the sort of, we, we look at the, uh, we're, we're so fixated on the, uh, that we, we, we really are unable to zoom out to the bigger picture of everything that is upstream of an image like that. And that, in a way, is uh, a certain model of architect that um, could be uh, synthesized in um, um, Ed Howard Rourke, uh, Ayn Rand's character from uh, The Fountainhead and this um, heroic figure that concentrates into um, the role of the architect an entire universe of um, an entire really um, paradigm. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's clear that that paradigm is production of growth and growth is something that our uh, book that began as a report for the UK government like what to do about growth, uh, indefinite growth within a closed ecosystem such as planet Earth, came to the conclusion that actually the problem is how we define prosperity. Like as soon as we start to uh, question the idea that prosperity is dependent on growth, suddenly uh, everything changes. And that was really, this observation was the starting point of non-extractive architecture. So if we question growth, if we question our definition of prosperity, what does that mean for architecture? And 
I think, um, how are we doing for time? Probably okay like a, for a couple, of more, couple more minutes. Few more minutes. So I'll just run through um, this book. I, I have a copy with me. I'll uh, pass it around afterwards. Feel free to take a look through. But it was most, mostly an attempt to round up a number of um, people who somehow um, are thinking about these, uh, thinking similarly heretical thoughts. Uh, I have some sort of in intuition in that direction. And to put them together in uh, a debate that is open-ended, that is not intended to produce some sort of um, consensus, but that is uh, in fact recognizing the fact that uh, probably we don't need a single paradigm, but we need many paradigms. We need to be much more aware of the specificity of conditions around the world. But to do that, we need to, there are a few key points that are more or less universal. The first is language. The problems that we're talking about are extremely uh, delicate and specific, and they require much more specific language. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where non the idea of non-extractive architecture possibly being more useful than sustainability, which is kind of incredibly generic and ends up in situations like this we could talk a long time about. I and mean, this is not a bad building, but I think it's possibly not that useful in getting us where we need to go. Um, complexity, uh, the, the idea that our buildings become more and more and more and more efficient has all sorts of problems in terms of the implications for the sort of, uh, what does that mean at a sort of an atomic level for the building? It means that those, these buildings become so complex, a bit like the, the whole question of iFixit and repairability of iPhones. It's so pretty similar for buildings. It's not that buildings are not repairable, they're just so unbelievably complex that it becomes very difficult to actually pay any sort of meaningful attention to mm -hmm. where your materials are coming, what are the conditions are being produced, and, and so on. Um, Invisibility, the um, concept with there's a lot of talk about uh, supply chains and about um, the kind of the disbalances of the marketplace created by that. But I think, in a way, the most diabolical thing about the invention of the supply chain, the reason why the supply chain was possibly the most significant, the container, you could say the shipping container being the most um, uh, significant invention of the 20th century, is the, again, decoupling of the pace of uh, consumption from the place of production with all of the um, attendant uh, externalities that are produced that are made possible. Mm -hmm. Because if you were digging up, if, if in order to build this building we had to dig up the sand from the bottom of the Yarra River with a consequent erosion of the build, all of the buildings around, probably we would not be building that many concrete buildings mm -hmm. uh, as we do. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, this idea of really kind of if we're going to talk about urbanism we need to be talking about urbanism not just in terms of the composition of a certain urban landscape but also in terms of what are the uh, uh, consequences what 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 is the sort of mirror image of that and for every skyscraper that sort of reaches into the sky there's often a hole that reaches down into the uh, yeah. ground inequality and uh, our reliance on um, extraction of labor so not just extraction of resources but also extraction of uh, dependency on a certain uh, disbalance um, inequality in the uh, labor marketplace and then this um, production of uh, dependency on uh, countless externalities that are produced elsewhere which are absolutely not reflected on the budget sheet mm. of architecture. So I think mm. to sum it up, I think it's actually very simple. It all comes down to what is on the budget sheet, what are we accounting for and what are we not accounting for. Mm. Um, I may be, um, I think, and just to kind of sum it up in a bit of a kind of a catchy soundbite, uh, but just, I think just trying to kind of make the point as bluntly as possible. Uh, we're so fixated with energy efficiency, like even if we make all of our buildings like dead energy efficient, we've actually probably, uh, if you simply draw a line, we've probably made the problem worse because mm -hmm. making buildings energy efficient is actually incredibly um, resource intensive and maybe we need to be actually stepping back uh, a moment and just asking how many buildings, do we actually need all of these buildings? Do mm -hmm. we need them to be so sort of universally um, formulated mm. and dependent on certain materials and so on. Anyway, I could go on for days, but uh, <laughs> we'll leave it at that for the moment. Fantastic. Thank you, Joseph. So um, we're actually going to throw straight to you, Mei Ling, actually. So, Basil, can you do the honors? <laughs> um, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, really happy to be here and um, also just get a, a feel for what the academic community is like here in Melbourne. Um, so the the presentation I gave yesterday was sort of a, a boiled down to sort of three material flows that I've been looking at. Um, 
which is sort of the cycling of materials between the land, the building, and uh, the plate. And by and large, um, it sort of takes a step back, you know, aside from the way materials are sort of spatialized, where they're produced, where they're consumed, if we were to abstract what is the actual value framework behind the way we use and process materials and where they end up, um, this sort of framework that you kind of see shows how value um, is sort of extracted from the land um, at unprecedented, really fast rates. It's sort of processed by labor groups who don't have agency to determine how much they get back from that, um, the input they put into production. Um, and we typically rely, particularly in high carbon economies, on a very centralized industrial model of production. And value there gets transformed exponentially um, from you know, its side of production. And that value gets sort of sequestered and accumulated in ownership structures. Um, and that value um, is sort of sold, say, as commodities to consumers who have no connection to those uh, generation mechanisms, whether that's the land or the labor. So we don't know what's in our materials. We have no idea who produced it. We have no idea the impact we have on contexts um, that are responsible for, for what we have in our homes, in our hands. And ultimately, we don't have any say in what happens to them after they leave, leave our buildings. Um, and that generates pollution, materials that are in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, and I was very interested in how one might at every stage of this value framework identify um, these forms of what we call alienated value. So whether that's land that is continuously extracted from, no nutrients are returned back to it in, in time frames that allow it to be productive. Um, whether that's um, uh, forms of production that do not take into account the worker's health um, and right to produce in an environment that is um, sustainably um, healthy, um, enjoyable. Um, whether it's waste, essentially, that has no way to return to the ground, so they're incredibly non-biocompatible. There's no way for those materials at the end of their life to restore health to the ecosystem. And where we as architects sort of sit within this framework has traditionally been you know, in that point in red, somewhere interacting between consumers and owners and driving that extraction cycle. Um, and that business model hasn't changed for a long time. Um, and that really limits our capacity to access value as well as circulate that value within a much wider framework. And so in ev every sort of research project or material that we design, we're looking at how an architect might be able to come into different points in this unalienation, which is the bottom half of this framework um, cycle. Um, how might we expand the agency of the architect, particularly at a time of sectorial collaboration, new understandings of materials. Um, and so I'll just show a couple of projects. Um, the first is sort of a flow between agriculture. is the only material stream that can actually meet some of the incredible goals that we have um, within this century to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. These are renewable, fast-moving, renewable products. Uh, two years ago, we produced 94 billion tons of them, 40% um, of which are typically pre-combusted, pre sorry, combusted prematurely before they can, you know, sort of become um, useful within a much wider ecology. Um, and by and large, the, the demand for building materials um, is far less than the supply. And you think about the fact that that's renewed every year um, and that it's so intricately tied to population growth. The more we grow, the byproducts that can come out of that sector. And there's a huge inventory. And, and these are not materials that we typically see, you know, when we, when we open a periodic chart or... Um, you know, think about the materials we, we look at in architecture textbooks. And breaking these materials down into their core components will help us figure out can they be used as structure, insulation, medium density panels and whatnot. Um, but there is also a cautionary aspect of this where we see the sort of four big grains, um, sugar, rice, wheat and straw. They dominate 50% of all agricultural waste that exists on the planet. And 
that also has huge impact. So if we rely on the monoculture model to supply the sort of building materials we need, we're going to be actually accelerating you know, um, the impact on our ecology. And we've got to broaden this to look at um, other streams of, of byproducts that are coming out of food. Um, and so the coconut was a flagship a material, um, mainly because over the last 20 years, I don't know if anybody drinks coconut water or uses coconut cosmetic products, but this is a multi-billion dollar industry that has driven the production of these materials um, along the equator. And what's amazing about it is sort of the fibers that are incredibly structural. And so in this sort of research, the architect uh, occupies that position of sitting between that waste product and coconut traders who sell coconut water in cities that are typically alienated. Um, they're not allowed to throw these waste byproducts into the municipal waste systems um, because they're so heavy. And so they illegally burn them at night in the city in Accra. I don't know if you've seen that, Patrick, but yeah, it's a big thing. And so this was an opportunity to green scale and create a new type of um, unalienated labor force. I'm just going to actually uh, point to the fact that there are so many transformation pathways for one agricultural byproduct like coconut husk, ranging from insulation all the way to materials like oak. And that lies in the way we process them and, and use them in our buildings. And so there's the whole mechanical performance, but there's also the, the performance to serve as really good desiccants, um, materials that absorb moisture in our buildings. Um, they perform much better than silica um, at particularly high humidities. Um, if they're burnt into activated carbon, they're amazing filters, which sequesters everything from CO2 to VOCs. So there's a ton of applications that one might look at um, and this is an example of an acoustic uh, panel um, when sort of assembled together can form an environmental module um, that is sort of designed to be integrated into an HVA system to filter mm. air. Um, so this sort of idea of value creation, how do we use design to really um, transform value and profits? Um, how do we begin to identify the value that people outside of our sectors play um, in order to circulate the profits um, to these new, this much wider network of uh, collaborators? Uh, I'll skip, I'll go through this very quickly. Um, one of the other opportunities for low, non, low energy, non toxic processing in this world is to look at fungi. Um, and fungi has been the, the species that has been able to decompose all forms of, of matter, including agricultural waste, incredibly efficiently. Um, and so we've sort of look, looked at using fungi as a, a technology to transform these materials. Over the course of five days, they sort of eat all of the sugar in these materials and can form this sort of low density insulation material. If pressed, you can get a sort of plywood uh, type of product. And although there is a huge biodegradability um, value in using them, I, I've sort of approached it more from how do we use this very simple technology um, to democratize who gets to play a role in biomanufacturing. And so this exhibition at Riva in, in Liverpool was about prototyping that. And so we sort of grew these panels in very simple kits um, with 200 people from middle schoolers to um, urban farmers in, in their 80s to generate a tunnel uh, at the entrance of the gallery. Mm. Um, and agricultural waste is, is also you know, just one of many other streams that fungi can eat. Fungi eat plastics, they eat food waste, um, they eat the, the barks of invasive species. So there's an infinite um, supply stream or food for, for these um, species, these organisms. Um, uh, there are new business models for working with companies that are growing these materials. Um, exciting things is seeing a biomanufacturing uh, company producing these building materials in food companies. Yeah. Um, and so there's collaboration and production that sort of can, can emerge at this intersection. Um, as a designer, uh, one does not need to own a factory to participate in this system. One can send a digital file to mill a form, vacuum form it into this sort of grow tray. Those grow trays could be used over and over again 
um, to sort of grow these materials and they can be sent to your client without you ever having to pay for storage, for refrigeration and all of this stuff. So there's sort of an economy of pr producing these materials now that is possible. Mm -hmm. And lastly, I'll end on food because why not? Um, the last year I've been working with a chef in Ghana and much like um, the food industry, the building industry sort of seen this sort of material trend where everything on your plate or in your building is imported. 80% of our materials in Ghana are imported. Uh, it's closer to 90% on, on the plate. This is jollof rice, which obviously we're the best. And we have a war with Nigeria and Senegal, but Ghana definitely has the best recipe. But um, <laughs> everything on that plate is now imported except the onions. And, and it's incredibly tragic given the, the wealth of agriculture in terms of rice farming. Um, as well as our poultry industry, which is suffering greatly. And so we actually started designing a couple of things, a menu, which was built around trying to educate people on some of the indigenous farming practices that are so integral to restoring value back to the land. Um, mm. And so these are, this is one of the meals that talks about multi-cropping, how the coconut tree is incredibly generous because it's super thin and allows all sorts of plants to grow underneath it. And so in tasting this meal, you taste the ecology. Mm. Um, and then a dessert, which is sort of an activated carbon-infused tiger nut milk with plantain and uh, groundnuts. Mm. I don't know if you're familiar with the street food. Kofi Brokeman, yeah. So it's Kofi Richmond. It's a transformation of this street food. Um, and we sort of created a dinner um, where we actually sourced 126 species of African rice that are no longer found in the country. Um, we, we got it from the seed bank in, in Svalberg in, in Norway, where the world's crop heritage is stored. And uh, the plants were actually served, or not served, sorry. <laughs> they were growing right on the dining table, um, in the communal dining table for, for those who came mm. to eat with us. And to scale it up and bring it back into the, into the land, into farms, um, we have this sort of um, public garden um, which is in the city. It's, it's one of the last remaining parks, the Afo Sutherland Park. And we were able to get uh, the site because it was a site that floods every, every um, rainy season. And we essentially um, <coughs> loaded it with a ton of breathable materials from coconut pith to stones and integrated the flood tolerant rice species to deal with water. Um, and the idea is to move from you know, the 10 grams of seeds we were given each plant gives us 200 seeds. They go into this garden and we can scale it up to, to give it to farms again to plant. Mm. So um, I'll end there. Um, yeah, and look forward to a discussion. Fantastic. Thank you, Meiling. Um, so interesting, both of you. So I'm going to ask Anoma now to um, respond to that, but bring in your own thinking and research around this, and particularly these questions that I know your work has been based around the, the design imagination of the global south and how that has been pushed to the periphery or continue to be pushed to the periphery. And yet, and yet what we just heard was sort of other ideas and incredibly vivid imaginations emerging from global south context. So maybe you'd, you'd like to respond to, to that, this kind of question. How do we deal with this ongoing marginalization despite the, the wealth and richness of the ideas and possibilities within the global south? So I'm just going to um, start by making a comment to Mei Ling because I grew up in Sri Lanka and we had to, in primary school, draw the coconut tree in great detail and identify every part of it that could be used. <laughs> and this was, you know, this was the wonder tree of our, you know, education. And of course we used uh, coconut milk instead of dairy in Sri Lanka, so it's, it's a, um, I guess your, your, um, presentation was very touching for me. Mm. You know, I always say, uh, you know that scene in Forrest Gump where they're like, shrimp of this and shrimp of that? Every, I get that with coconut all the time. Like, coconut <laughs> butter, coconut milk, coconut soap, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, every, every part of that coconut tree has a function. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. a miracle, yeah, tree. But it's wonderful to see it. I mean, we, we used to think of coconut wood as a kind of cheap okay. product that we would use because uh, we had completely depleted our timber resources, not by producing concrete, but by producing brick, uh, kiln-firing mm. bricks. And uh, because of that, 
uh, wood like coconut and rubber wood started entering the market. Mm. And uh, these were, of course, part of the industrial agriculture yeah. that was introduced during colonial times. Um, but anyway, that's, that's a mm. different story. Um, I'm going to kind of um, segue into Joseph's um, discussion on concrete because I wanted to speak about the exhibition that just closed at MoMA, in which I was involved. And it was called The Project of Independence. Do you want me to hold it up for you? So, yeah. Architectures of Decolonization uh, in South Asia, 1947 to 1985. And I guess part of what I'm saying is that it took so long for um, an exhibition like this to be held uh, in the West. And quite frankly, I was quite disappointed at the lack of interest in this uh, exhibition in Australia. Um, and I feel that this has something to do with what uh, Dan has just mentioned about who produces knowledge and whose knowledge is seen as um, the canonical um, knowledge that all architecture students must learn. And there, is, um, there was a, in a re recent teacher to teacher workshop that I was uh, co-organizing, a young scholar said, I'm tired of teaching about other people's um, cultures as being superior than my own. Make them valued, make them seen as something that can contribute, uh, not seen as the places that are always receiving knowledge from the West. Recipients are so applicable to the Global South, mm. everything that you're saying. Mm. This way of excavating these uh, layers underneath. Now, Joseph, of course, the project of independence, 1947 to 1985, is very much about concrete. Of course. Yeah? It's about the way in which the politics of concrete, the introduction of concrete as a material, um, produced institutional and um, kind of state-driven in, in a very socialist economy um, examples of architecture that enabled people to become emancipated from the colonial uh, processes and the aesthetics associated with colonization. Mm -hmm. Now one of the challenges of this exhibition was not to show Chandika and not to show um, Louis Kahn's Dhaka project, because when you think about South Asia, everybody thinks about Le Corbusier, Louis Kahn, and Latins. Yeah, that's, that's the Western impression of South Asia. Or temples, temples and mosques, right? So how do we get past that? And um, I guess in this exhibition, we looked at the labor that went into this, because it was labor-intensive production of architecture. We looked at... Um, Themes like industry, housing, um, politics, urbanism, mm. civic institutions, rather than architects and their projects. Mm. We didn't look at private uh, commissions or private commercial buildings. We focused on the projects that actually created social change. Now, these are highly criticized projects. Yeah, these are projects that, um, because of their um, manifestation of modernist aesthetics were seen as inappropriate for their um, settings. Another framing for the exhibition was to see South Asia as a region rather than get trapped into the national discourse on architecture. Mm. You know, India's architects, Pakistan's architects, Sri Lanka's architects. And this was again an important understanding of how in that period after independence, there were similar sensitivities to the informal ways in which these societies occupied architecture. And I think the greatest contribution of that period was in the way in which modernism was completely transformed to accommodate social practices. And um, I'm using social rather than cultural here, because cultural is always seen in a kind of archaic way. This, you know, what is South Asian culture? You go to an exhibition, you expect to see bright colors, you expect to you know, smell spices, I don't know. <laughs> it's this orientalized version mm. of South Asia. Mm. So I want to say social because it was really about bringing um, a social group from who had been suppressed 
into uh, active participation in the project of decolonization. Right. Right. And I think this knowledge production was very important. Mm. So to kind of direct the questions back to you, mm. I think in that informality, in the ways in which informality was incorporated, in the ways in which these buildings became porous, and despite the sort of um, perception of them in a negative way, which you know persists, there is something in the way in which these knowledges entered architecture in those countries, like Khan's such and such, that building looks like, they're not able to see them as being produced by their locations and the politics and social problems of a context. Hmm. And so it would be interesting for me to ask you both how you will integrate those kinds of issues. And you have, just of you have sort of touched on it because you've begun to show the labor, the exploitation of labor, and you've begun to show how these agroeconomies actually work in these. Uh, the production of materials. Mm. Um, I think the, I mean, there's so many different, you know, angles to the question that you are asking. I, I kind of maybe want to go back to the fact that, you know, in these sort of concrete high carbon economies, um, again, if you want to abstract what the ecological framework was around that and the politics of who gets to do what where in that in that framework. Um, there was sort of this bifurcation between who produces and who transforms value. And I think in the materials that I work with, um, apart from agricultural waste, it's about trying to bring back research, the production of knowledge into conduct context of historic production. Um, uh, and I think that's very difficult to do unless the architecture research framework changes. Um, the academic industrial alliances that we have are incredibly important. Um, what it means to truly understand the ecological impact of material. Um, and I do think, I mean, it's, it's we talk about these materials in the global north as, um, as though they were independent of contributions from people in the global south. I mean, one of the most potent examples of, of that is pharmaceutical um, you know, uh, materials, mm. which are so based on herbal uh, traditions and sort of scale that up to the detriment of any other co-constituent material. Um, and that has huge impacts, not only on your body, but ob obviously on the wider ecology. Right. Um, and I think about that a lot, you know, in the material language, how do you have a collaboration of materials? Because it is in that collaboration that you can actually really temper the impact on an ecology and a society. Mm. Um, so, a couple of responses to your question. Yeah, thank you. And so, I'm going to link to Patrick. I know, I know we could talk about this for an hour, so forgive me for moving us around here, but um, this question of um, well, what Val Plumwood used to call shadow places, you know, the places where things come from being separated from where they're used, and then this question of the design imagination and the social imagination locally versus what's flown in from overseas. Um, Patrick, your work has been very much about this in the context of Ghana, uh, understanding new technologies like 3D printing there, and therefore beginning to also bring in ideas and practices from elsewhere versus what's done locally with local materials and local knowledges. Would you like to build on some of this? Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dan. Mm. And uh, first, I would like to say that uh, I'm not an architect. I'm an urban planner. But I work mostly with architects and uh, those within the building and construction industry. Mm. And uh, it is important that uh, we talk about this issue at this time in the sense that uh, issues of climate change, issues of urbanization, are the defining features of our time. So I really appreciate the comments and the works that our guests are doing, and I think that it will go a long way in uh, reorienting ourselves in adopting sustainable and also non-extractive materials in uh, producing and building our uh, urban system. Mm. Uh, I, I'm not an architect, but I have a lot of questions for them. <laughs> uh, the first relate to a project that uh, 
I'm doing together with uh, a colleague from University of Wollongong and uh, supported by World Economic uh, Forum. And we are looking at how we can use 3D printing technology to build affordable and adaptable houses for informal settlement within African cities. So uh, one of the main challenges that we have encountered is that across the continent of Africa, most, of, most part of Africa was colonized and uh, Although colonization has ceased, but elements of that still remain. And one of the key issues that we identified was that the people have come to accept Western cultures to the extent that we live mostly in the tropical region, but our building materials, our building architecture is, is developed based on the Western concept to the extent that our buildings that do not need to be ventilated using air conditions are all grassed and we have to use air conditioning to do that. And it has gotten to a point that the people, especially in Accra, in uh, Nairobi, and uh, in Harare, in Zimbabwe, they, they've come to a point that they don't acknowledge the value of uh, indigenous or local materials in the production of our houses. Mm. So my question to uh, our guests is, uh, how do we change the orientation of uh, the people themselves who have come out more? And second, uh, the architecture schools in Ghana, in most part of Africa, is just build or develop on Western ideologies with a few uh, exceptions to Egyptian uh, histories and all that. Mm -hmm. How do we change this system of uh, understanding that has predisposed our uh, people in the continent, mostly in the Anglophone uh, continent, to the understanding of accepting local building, uh, not accepting local building materials, but making uh, valuing themselves within the context of European and the Western uh, systems. Because uh, it has gotten to a point that if you live in a house that is de uh, designed based on European architecture, which is basically, uh, especially the roof is designed such that it, it, it snows, but it doesn't snow in most parts of Africa, mm. but we have such buildings across Accra, across Nairobi, and other parts of our African cities. Mm. How do we change this uh, narrative, mm. given that the people have not developed that appetite for Western culture? Thanks. Thank you, Patrick. That, it occurs to me that's also a relevant question in Australia, of course, where we sort of, um, uh, depending on how you think about it, but a northern country in the south or a, a western country in the far east. But um, Joseph, would you like to respond to Patrick's question there about this, um, the valuing of local, and, and yesterday we talked about how this is then not really a, if it's about value, it's not really a technical question as such, it's a cultural Absolutely. question. No, I mean, I think, um, again, it's such a, uh, an in there are so many angles to come to this <laughs> question on um, that it's really uh, difficult to pick the single one that is most uh, important, but I think um, certainly from my perspective, and I, going, just going back briefly to your exhibition, I think one of the um, important, uh, uh, one of the reasons that this exhibition is a significant milestone is that it um, picks out uh, a number of projects that are probably overlooked, and it highlights how they are incredible examples of specificity. They're not uh, generic. They build on a foundation of knowledge, of, of local culture, um, and augment it somehow with the best of contemporary technologies, which at the time, I mean, you, I think you're, you're right to point out that concrete was in fact instrumental in the creation of specificity in these cases. It wasn't about uh, the, 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 the kind of replication of the generic. It was actually about really kind of um, extracting some of the most uh, 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 visionary dimensions of cultures that had very few other channels of expression and somehow making those permanent and visible. Um, and, and that's what kind of makes this uh, really incredible. And like I said, I, I, unfortunately, like I think many of us didn't have the opportunity to go to New York, but uh, mm. having kind of uh, had a look through the catalog, uh, I think that that is um, something that will endure um, thanks to your work. But in a way, the mirror image of that is coming to your uh, point about the generic, uh, because unfortunately, your, what you, the, the work that you analyzed, what South doesn't have a monopoly on bad generic architecture. There's just <laughs> as much of it in the North um, as well. Uh, and so I think that the problem, uh, kind of really trying, uh, addressing your question, the problem is not so much um, the absence of good architecture on planning, uh, uh, themes of, um, uh, of generic, which are 
extremely problematic um, and useful only and, and made possible kind of that, that actually makes sense only in an unregulated uh, market economy where you have no incentive and there's no uh, no no framework is provided to make sure that what is built has some sort of resonance with the conditions within which it's built. And so I think the question is, um, how do we actually begin to recognize the fact that producing bad architecture that is that performs poorly, uh, that creates um, civic conditions that are undesirable, how do we disincentivate that? How do we build around that a series of uh, conditions that make it mm. not make sense to do that? Mm. Um, and. And I think that if you if you look back to, I mean, I, I think there are examples of just I, I think because it's relevant in this instance in the fact in that it was uh, also presented at MoMA, um, architecture without architects. I mean, I, I think it's a problematic exhibition in many ways in terms of the sort of the viewpoint of the kind of the singular uh, nature of Bernard Rudowski's viewpoint onto the world. But if something, if kind of looking through that book, uh, something emerges is the um, value of specificity um, and the fact that in, in that book nothing was produced that didn't make sense. Every single project in that yeah. book has, uh, it, it springs from a very specific set of conditions and if we could think collectively as a species, as a society, as, uh, as beings on how can we again um, and take a step back from the sort of uh, idea that um, the, the only way to operate is to uh, reproduce uh, an extremely bland uh, and generic formula um, that we kind of consider to be an indicator of modernity, of prosperity, of um, uh, wealth and uh, uh, whatever, uh, and instead celebrate the value of uh, architecture that somehow is the expression of the best of a place, the way that this is. So yeah. in a way to kind of sum it up, how do we actually make that, instead of making it into the exception, make it into the norm? Yeah. Uh, for the very simple reason also, I think it would just make the world so much more incredible architecture replicated uh, in every corner of the planet. Yeah, which is again ending on that cultural question. So um, I'm going to ask you in a moment also to respond to Patrick's question, but I know it's 11 o'clock and I think you guys now have to scoot to your next appointment. So, <laughs> so while you're preparing an answer, I'm going to frame a question in a way that's long enough to slide out to Noma and Patrick. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you to thank you. these guys. And we will uh, continue the conversation outside of this room. Um, and of course, anybody listening as well, come and find Patrick and Anoma, if you're interested in these questions and you want to continue the conversation here as well. Um, thank you. Thank you both. So next up, we're going to tag team in Alex Felsen and Gioti Shukla. Um, I'm going to ask Mei Ling to respond to Patrick's question because he's still around us somewhere. And uh, it's also a good link to Gioti, this last question, also about this question of value and how people value um, these tangible and intangible conditions like ecosystems and ecologies and materials. And, uh, and then we're also going to hear from Alex as well and his amazing work around landscape architecture and the materiality of place, which is also cultural and ecological at the same time. So I'll give these guys a, a moment to kind of get into the groove of this thing. But Mailing, um, Patrick's still there. So, <laughs> so, th so this question about then this sort of understanding of um, you have a, a startup in Accra, and you're also a professor at Yale. So you're straddling this kind of global north, global south, uh, uh, dare I say, arguably traditional um, university world at, at Yale, and then this um, incredibly complex, dynamic, fast-moving environment in Accra. Would you like to, how do, how do you reconcile these things in your head? You're sort of embodying <laughs> this challenge to some degree yourself, right? I mean, uh you know, to Patrick's question, I think, and, and also kind of relating back to the first question, yeah. um, people build with concrete because it's incredibly accessible and, and affordable. And affordable is relative. People's willingness to pay for that material is so high because there's a social aspiration um, associated with the value of concrete, which is materials of control, um, durability, um, to some extent, and class, really, right? Um, and you look at all the ways in which um, 
architects specify and are allowed to put materials into buildings. You think of codes, and it's materials like concrete, um, wood, which is incredibly expensive and rare now to, to use in Ghana. Those are the materials that are specified in code. So for anyone wanting to do something different, the barriers to do that are so high. You know, you've got to find high-skilled labor. Um, you've got to understand the material performance to prove, to get permission to build with it these days. And so it's incredibly tough. Um, and what I think was, is beautiful about some of the South Asian examples, you know, of tropical modernism and the use of concrete was that there was this aspiration to translate an architecture from the material to the form of the building, that new identity. You know, who were they as, as, a company, as a country that had just achieved independence, which we see in a lot of um, tropical modernist architectures in, in, in Ghana, for example, too. And there were industries that were created specifically around, you know, producing those architectures, which we don't have and we need for low carbon materials. Um, and I think there's a huge part of this, which is psychological. It goes back to our deep codes around comfort and control. Um, if you've lived in a building that's made out of earth or natural fibers, you realize how comfort is, is incredibly slow and tempered. You have the veranda, you have um, the interior, which is cooler and darker. It's like an embryo. Um, there's a social life that happens in the veranda during the day, and you, you go closer into the inside at night. You have materials that deal with moisture as it changes from night to day. And that's very different than you know pressing a button and getting cold, dry air very quickly. Um, and so this collapsing of you know per environmental performance to this two-dimensional surfaces, whether that's a double glazed window or a concrete with a sliding glass window comes along you know, with these deep codes around control. And until we can um, overcome that, uh, flex our muscles around um, <coughs> discomfort, whatever you want to call it, uh, a way of living in, in connection to the environmental flows outside, mm. um, that's very difficult to change, which is why food to me is so important because you can change people's taste you know there's mm. something aspirational about delicious food mm. delicious architecture what is that like um, <laughs> we're talking about that with Indy yesterday uh, or the day before um, how do you make a building that's weatherful um, and how do you design for thermal thermal delight because our bodies are capable of adapting in incredible ways mm. um, we've divorced our bodies from space in a big way you mm. know so I love the idea of expanding the palette in that way, the palette for architecture, in the same way we talk about expanding the palette for food. I should point out, by the way, that Indy Johar is at the back of the room. He was another one of the, the speakers here at Living Cities, and he's, he's ready to heckle there from the back, like, like the old guys in the Muppets, I guess. Uh, he's going he's gonna to throw something down in a second, so I might come to you in a bit, Indy. Um, Jyoti, uh, your work here is really around in a sense, the kind of um, from the real estate industry point of view, and you've been looking at uh, the real estate industry in India and other places, which is a very big and diverse place, of course, in its own right, and how they begin to place a value, or, or do they begin to place a value on these questions of materiality, um, to some extent indigeneity, or local material flows, and ecological practices more broadly. So around the idea of green would be the very shorthand way of saying that. But can you give us a glimpse into your, your research has revealed, at least um, in the work in India and then beyond, if you like. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Jyoti Shukla, and I'm a lecturer in property. And when we hear property, we think we are the bad guys. Uh, we talk <laughs> about the monetary value, and that is all what is the driver behind the bad buildings, which are not naturally adoptable and you know, uh, uh, causing all the carbon emission, etc. All that said, uh, there is a lot of self-realization that we, uh, that happens when such work comes out and gets published, where we say that, okay, people ethically and morally want green spaces, they want natural materials to be used, but there is less willingness to pay for it whether it's food products in the shells, if they are organic, or whether it's natural building materials, which are, which are less carbon emitting, whether it's climate responsive buildings, how much is our willingness to pay for it? And 
we find that our willingness to pay is very low. We just want to pay as much as we are paying for any other traditional contemporary building or any other traditional food. I'm comparing it food, taking forward the discussion from what Mei Ling said. So if we are not willing to get out of our comfort, uh, be it in physical body sense, like adopting to thermal conditions, or be it in the context of paying a little bit out of pocket if we can afford to, how do we expect changes to happen? Mm. So it is a sense of realization as well at individual level. Now what my work talks about is also in the broader context of human well-being. We understand our well-being much better than environmental well-being. But it's very interrelated. One of the aspects of human well-being, as identified by Martha Nussbaum, is our ability to be able to live with other species and nature. Mm. So if we have taken ourselves out of the natural world and created what we call the built environment for us, which absorbs many things from the nature, but without giving back much, and then we try to understand how comfortable are we in this built environment when our basic needs are still sort of rooted partially in the natural environment which we have left far ago. So we find in the context of building use that our productivity is better if we are in energy efficient green buildings, which means that we have not, not lost our comfort as much away from nature as we think we have. We still find it slightly difficult to, to adjust in a very naturally insensitive building. Mm -hmm. we, we respond better productivity wise, but our willingness to pay for it less is less. Mm -hmm. So uh, the concept of well-being is understood at a personal level and probably there is a way forward for us to understand and uh, incentivize on personal uh, well-being and what is that incentive at individual level that can drive us to then adopt to uh, more naturally responsive ways of living and also producing mm. buildings. Mm. Now, a lot of uh, my work talks about post-disaster recovery and how can we uh, create more resilient societies, not only in the physical built environment context, but also the natural and the social environment context, how can we build back better, not in the sense of mere physical building back better, but also trying to be more resilient, more close to the nature so that we don't have to contradict nature e every time. So maybe I'll ask a question to both our uh, wonderful speakers here that how, how do you think the pace of uh, recovery that is required and the scale of recovery that is required how do you think these kind of uh, very responsible, responsible and naturally responsive techniques can adopt to post-disaster challenges? Mm. I understand it's an ironic situation because in the first place, if we use those material, we, we reduce the footprint and we reduce uh, our, uh, or probably we can at least be you know, uh, contributing to the natural world a little bit and less climate change will be slow, if not stop. But Mm. and therefore the disasters will be less mm. or less intense, less frequent. But that's a very long cycle. Mm. In the immediate world, we still need to respond. We need to acknowledge that we have changed a lot and there will be uh, much intense and much more frequent natural disasters and still we will have to put people back into shelters, we will have to provide them quick housing and we will have to create a society where, or, or a built environment very quickly for them to <coughs> get back to yeah. uh, normal where they were. So how do you think these, uh, because how do you think these natural mm. uh, material and things can respond to those kind of urgent needs? Mm. Maybe, Joseph, I'll come to you on this one. I, I know you didn't show it because I curtailed your time so severely, but the, um, the post-storm wood reclamation work that you showed yesterday, maybe something is in that context, because well, you'll explain in a moment. But I think there's this very interesting framing you just did, Jyoti, around well-being and the well-being industry, and you, you spoke about coconut milk as a kind of prime example of that, but not really the, as you said, there's not this wider sense of well-being for, uh, or a well-tempered environment, as Bannon might have said, but expanding that into well-being, and which would then get into this, not just this recovery mode all the time, and recognizing that we're now in a, arguably a continuous crisis, 
It's not crisis recovery, crisis recovery. It's just ongoing. Anybody in New South Wales now is, the floorboards are still probably pretty damp, you know, and it's going to rain again soon. So, so this shifting of the perspective to this, how do we deal with this as an ongoing practice there? So, Joseph, your work in, in that particular instance, you can respond to Joseph's question however you'd like, but it, it does occur to me that was a post disaster recovery predicated then through a kind of architecture emerging from that mm. that was also social at the same time. Isn't it? Yeah, um, I think it is a relevant project, but not in perhaps the most uh, sort of obvious way because right. I think it's the most. Um, it's the smallest of band-aids possible. It's like absolutely <laughs> not going to solve anything uh, if we start using um, simply discard wood that was uh, uh, ripped out of the ground by um, a massive storm. Uh, it's important to do that um, and to kind of make the effort to uh, minimize um, impact and to use uh, materials that are available rather than sourcing them from somewhere elsewhere and, uh, and so on. Uh, but. I think that the value of the project, and something I was kind of trying to hint at yesterday, uh, for me even more important than what was produced, um, the, the, the kind of the infrastructure, the, the product that came out of that project, mm. uh, was the process behind it. Like the, it was a fantastic um, one-week workshop that we did to build this stage, in which um, it's, it's kind of funny the. Um, the origins of that project were we were commissioned to design the stage for this music festival and we designed it out of wood and we said we'd like it to be made out of this kind of wood and for all sorts of sort of legislative re uh, reasons of uh, permitting and so on it had to be manufactured by somebody so we got all of these, these quotes and it was coming in at 40, 50, 60, 70,000 euros and they were just saying like there's no way this is going to uh, be possible so um, we kind of like sat down with a piece of paper and like sketched out the material, ma material value was somewhere five, six, seven thousand euros. So, okay, let's make it into a party. Uh, we we have a kind of a week long uh, social event where the act of building this thing becomes a reward in itself, and we come in on budget because they had ten thousand euros to build it. And and for what was really rewarding for me was um, the situation that was created around the necessity for that um, project for the for the for that stage. <coughs> And so to answer your question more directly, I think we have a problem that is at such a scale um, mm. that unless we, it's a, it's a structural problem, the way that we exist, um, the, 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 it's simply like completely incompatible with our current sort of value system. Um, that, that, that we have to, that there are two things that can change. Either we change planet or we change the value system. And so I think going back to uh, kind of Mailing's point about the sort of aspirational value of certain things like concrete buildings or like um, a certain uh, type of food or all of these sort of things that we have trained ourselves to use as indicators of wealth and poverty or um, and so on, that's what we need to work on. Like what is prosperity? What's the definition of prosperity? And Tim Jackson's work is incredibly interesting because it makes the argument that the current definition of prosperity is completely arbitrary. It's like nobody, it's not like a, uh, and I think like also um, Uncle Dave's talk yesterday, like so much sort of uh, indigenous culture um, holds up a completely different set of things to be important. And mm. interestingly, those are almost universally about groups of people coming together to exchange immaterial value as in this workshop that we did. Mm. Um, rather than like the stage is worth 60,000 euros. And, yeah. and reframing the idea of prosperity into um, something that is made up much more of, uh, if we want to use the sort of current e economic terminology, services, mm. um, and create the creation of uh, immaterial value, value that is not based on uh, uh, a kind of a currency of hydrocarbon, or because it's not hydrocarbon intensive or mm. carbon intensive. Um, then we can start to uh, really kind of solve the problem. Mm. Uh, but it, without, I, I'm, I'm, it may be just me, but I can't f think of a way that we're actually going to come even remotely close to doing anything that's of any sort of uh, meaningfulness unless we work first on our definition of prosperity and what, what we work for. I don't know what you, <laughs> no, <laughs> whether no, I'm no. crazy. <laughs> I actually think that know the post-disaster context is probably one of the most potent sites where we can reinvent material economies um, you've got you know if you look at the patterns of occupation 
trying to assemble very quick shelter. Um, I mean, the 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 age of these sh uh, shelters, these refugee camps, are probably on the order of like decades now. They're growing into little cities. Um, but for those that you know, sort of only last two months a year, and people have to leave, you have to leave such a small environmental footprint, which isn't the case, right? We see that with militaries and 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 large migrations of people. Um, and I think that's what kind of challenges the material systems. How do you erect very quickly? How do you design for disassembly? How might you also look at other assets in the landscape to embed some form of resiliency, whether it's the absorption of um, flooding, for example, earthquakes, um, even just security, privacy? You're asking your materials to do a, a whole lot of things that are very, very specific. Um, it also introduces, you know, in, in places where um, are prone, like in you know, Japan, to constant um, environmental disasters, a hierarchy of using high carbon materials in very specific places in the building and a much more fast moving, replaceable meat of the building. Um, so I, I think that, you know, when you talk about post disaster, there's almost a clarity that one needs to have and you mm. sort of reduce the complexity of what you need from your materials and decide, you know, performance in a very, very um, elemental sense. Mm. So that's very exciting, you know, as, as a place to sort of mm. reinvent um, what material systems might be. Um, yeah. No, thank you, Melanie. Um, I'm not going to bring in Alex. That's actually a great link. Alex Felsen, who's the Chair of Landscape Architecture here in the faculty. Welcome. Um, fresh from a, a meeting, so you, you, missed the, you missed the first hour or so. Um, but this question of resilience is in your wheelhouse. <laughs> so it would be great if you could respond to uh, this question. I may be talking about the Resilient Connecticut work you've been in, which is in the context of recovery, I guess, from Superstorm Sandy, which is very much about this kind of how would one use material landscapes directly, meaningfully in this post-recovery context. Um, and then equally building on what Joseph was saying, this question of indigeneity and the work you've done around Birarang Ma here are beginning to do with uh, our colleague Jufa Greenaway and others. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello everybody, I'm Alex Felsen uh, in Landscape Architecture and pleasure to be here with you guys. Um, it sounds like we're deep in discussion here so I'll try yeah, yeah. to uh, jump in. Um, <laughs> Okay, well, uh, I, I think, you know, I did, I have worked, so I, I taught at Yale for a decade and worked um, between the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies School of Architecture and worked with uh, the state of Connecticut as a director of design for resilience. And so I worked on a lot of uh, projects actually built by retention gardens with a low income community in Bridgeport, um, pre Sandy, pre um, Irene. It was hit by both and it was an interesting process uh, and experience for the landscape to fail. But I think, I think one of the things from all of this experience is that, um, you know, in, in one sense, there's a question of what scale are you working at? What's the, what, what are you, what kind of, um, what, what are you impacting? And I think that oftentimes the, the individual building isn't actually the scale at which uh, the impact is needed, mm. uh, or it isn't the scale at which you can make the kind of changes that would be valuable changes from a resiliency perspective. Mm. So typically when we're working in um, adaptive and most more by, um, flood risk and existing infrastructure systems and sub-basin watersheds and um, and just in some ways trying to dissolve some of the political um, boundaries and other um, decision-making scales that impact choices that people are making. So rather than have one person decide to um, to spend money on a seawall that protects their home, to actually think in a more collective fashion, uh, recognizing that the flood risk in managing a, um, a community of dwellers requires a broader uh, understanding and perspective. Yeah. It's very difficult to negotiate this kind of um, uh, strategies, and there are winners and losers in that context. The the bioretention gardens that we built, we used a stone suit model similar to what you're describing. So we didn't. We had twenty thousand. We they put in ten thousand. Um, we we framed it as a designed experiment. So we embedded research, and we had researchers involved in the construction. Um, and then the city put in all the equipment to build it. Um, we built it in a low-lying area that continually flooded. Um, it was next to a parking lot and it drained the water from the parking. And for that one reason, because it drained the parking lot, the community accepted it. Um, 
and they only accepted it by about 55%. Because <laughs> there was a whole contingent that was pretty much against spending money on it because they didn't see it as valuable. Right. Even though that community was built in the floodplain and, um, and actually faces ongoing uh, risks, and I don't think they really have a clear solution to their problem. So they're essentially, they purchased a home that's in the floodplain that's, um, unless you built a very expensive seawall, you're really not getting around the issue that it's uh, repeatedly flooding, which mm. it already does. Mm. They had three feet of water, um, a meter of water when, during Sandy. But that, um, the construction of that in the three years that I spent working on it with the community, they actually formed a stormwater management group. And then they, that led to, um, fed into the Rebuild by Design program that was part of, started by um, HUD and the Rockefeller. Uh, so it was a collaborative model between federal funding and, um, and phil philanthropic funding. Mm -hmm. And it had a whole set of issues, the Rebuild by Design initiative had a, a lot of community engagement issues with it. But the interesting thing was that that community um, pushed for and was successful in getting, um, we were successful as a team in getting $10 million for that area of um, Bridgeport. So there was a kind of way in which the local scale action and the activity that brought um, brought certain people together and uh, uh, around a mission and a goal um, was helpful in framing the um, the project moving forward. There was also a dog park built in the community garden that was built that had been they've been trying to build for ten years, which. I've been, several community members have told me that the project that we did had nothing to do with the success of that. So it's <laughs> <laughs> interesting at a local level, but I guess, I think that the, the um, you know, I think that the, I think working locally and trying to change, uh, full, change attitude and change, um, uh, uh, developing kind of vision and transformative understanding and also building collective understanding of the risks and the challenges to, yeah. f to foreground the opportunity to work collaboratively to make change is yeah. key. Yeah. I feel like um, the I always, when I work with uh, architects, I always try to um, have them think about the building not as the building as an object, but the building as part of a larger system, and I to blur the boundaries or the uh, of that building, um, and to think about it in relation to the infrastructure components that are part of it. And the top of the the building rooftop is this, is a, the top of the watershed, and uh, developing vertical treatment systems for water systems that can manage that water in site, but also thinking about. Um, well, while, yeah, we worked with engineering to develop a, a proposal for thermal green walls, which rejected heat from the building into uh, adjacent public spaces as a way of starting to think about how yeah. buildings can be more self-sufficient and functional. Yeah. Um, and I do think that the, you know, um, uh, location and siting and, and site planning uh, is absolutely critical. And I think there are a lot of, I know that it's challenging for, um, in architecture, because you have a client um, build a relationship, and so you're essentially often given a site, but recognizing the location that you're building in, for example, um, Fisherman's Bend, uh, the university is essentially investing billions of dollars in a post-industrial contaminated floodplain mm -hmm. uh, that has um, the groundwater is you know a meter down, and, and there's um, and uh, there's all kinds of issues associated with it. So I think the idea of um, well, I think I think. Learning about and understanding resiliency opportunities and understanding um, where and how to construct that has long-term benefit. And, yeah. and then breaking that down in, in, in incremental strategies. That's not just about the materiality and the construction, although that's absolutely critical, but also about the uh, development of um, education and social um, yeah. social dialogue and interdisciplinary yeah, collaboration. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. On another project that I worked on with uh, the related company, we had a... Um, there was a plan to build a $60 million um, stormwater um, system as part of this typical development. And that's one of the other issues, I think, is that I think while, while there's vision and high quality in architecture, there are a lot of developers that are constructing and building environments that are pretty you know, mediocre and that are um, at the status quo. And I think it's a, partly a question of how do you influence that. Mm. The, the, the huge amount of construction that's going on that doesn't have um, that vision or, or intuition or careful uh, attention that I think the more academic architecture um, the world does. Yeah. But in that case, we there was a plan to essentially drain water using the road systems for a 500 hectare site down to this low point, and which took away the water from all the wetland systems on site. So it was, it was hugely detrimental from an ecological standpoint, but, but that aspect of the project was poorly understood by um, the developer and by the um, designers and, mm. the, and, and the engineers. Mm. And so there's a kind of, I guess there's room to really think um, more holistically about, about 
collage perform performance and site function and try to integrate that into the design more effectively. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Can I, go ahead. Uh, so I think that I might actually ask you to pick this one up because I think it's a really important point you're making here about blurring and blurring the edge of the boundary with the ecosystem, of the building with the ecosystem around it. Um, and, but Joseph, you're also talking about answering a blurring, what we both were, of material flows, as in, we're not, if we stare at the building, you have this very simple diagram implied in your text. If a building's going up here, there's a hole going down over here somewhere. You know, just by definition, there's a push and pull between on the planet in that way. And that would mean an understanding of those flows, not just flows, as you said, Alex, of flood water or biodiversity, but also material, labor, and economics. So um, I'll come back to you about Birang Mar, actually, because I want to hear about that. But Jyoti, this, this sense of how do, do developers, who often hold the cards in these contexts, um, back to your research about how are developers beginning to understand different ways of framing the value of blurring the red line around a, a plot, given that they have bought the, within the red line how do they understand the kind of impact of that? Are they beginning to flip it from an externality as in a cost they just ignore or hide somewhere into a value of some kind? Yeah, I think uh, I'll refer to what Joseph was saying earlier about unregulated economies where uh, developers are driven by uh, profits. Mm. So whatever gives them more profit is what will drive their approach to the development around the site. Mm. Now that approach is slowly changing as uh, green certification is becoming more, and more mm -hmm. and more important. And one of our latest research in the Australian context told us that uh, across six dimensions of uh, environment, uh, developers opt on a higher preference. They give more preference to, say, responding to uh, water efficiency, energy efficiency. And also, they take account of the ecosystem and community around because these things uh, translate into, firstly, these things translate into savings for the end user. And secondly, some of these things, like the natural environment existing around them, to safeguard it, for example, if there is a wetland or there is a, uh, an old tree with heritage protection on it, these things are not requiring additional cost. Mm -hmm. It's easy to build around them, and, to, and it also makes it more attractive for uh, responsible users who mm -hmm. now opt for it but don't want to, as I said, don't want to pay more for it, but, but they prefer a, a, a residential development or an office development which responds to uh, the environment and is more green certified as opposed to any, any other mm -hmm. project. So developers do take account of these uh, things. However, what they still are missing on is material. Right. So that is still a big constraint and I think we, most of the discussions in this panel are around uh, changing our approach to using uh, material which are environmentally uh, more sustainable and responsible. Mm -hmm. So one more interesting finding in, in uh, one of the research tells us in the context of uh, 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 large-scale retail formats is that first is the, the carbon emission and the embedded energy cost of the material that is used in the construction of it. But we often ignore the operational cost or embodied energy in the operational cost yeah. where the refurbishing happens very frequently and we get rid of a lot of fixtures and uh, condition. They are considered waste after certain years and they yeah. add to the carbon footprint. So overall, I think regulations will play an important role going forward. And there is more and more uh, corporate social responsibility, which blue chip clients are now realizing, investors are now realizing, which then is uh, pushing developers to respond to these things. So there, there has to be some incentive mm. uh, for developers to respond to it. It could be a regulatory pressure, or it could be a monetary incentive, or it could be an incentive in the form of demand from end users and investors. Yeah. Yeah. So th that, that, that change is required. Definitely. So there's, and, and it goes back to, I suppose, that's the, the first small steps in a long journey to the kind of reframing that Joseph is implying, I suppose, which is actually a, a, a completely different economic model around these things, as in we, we can't use the same practices that got us into this mess to also get, it, get us out of it. So there's, and we might start with this corporate social responsibility or regulatory tweaks or massaging the market in that way. Um, um, but where it ends up is an interesting thing. I, I might come to you on this one, Mailing, actually, because it's, uh, 
this is also a shift in terms of the way we understand, I sort of pick up these, these questions here, understand the starting point for also architects and designers. Instead of starting with the building and then going off for a search for materials, <laughs> it strikes me that your work is kind of coming from materiality towards buildings, almost. I don't know if this is a fair framing at all, but it's the way I perceive it. And so um, within that process, you can start with the materiality of place and the flows within it and the community and the productions of labor, which is me. This, these are my 20,000 square meters. It's a library or a shopping mall, and now we're going to go and talk materials. You know? So that, that reversal, does that enable us to think about value in a different way because you're able to carry the all of that different type of value with you by pursuing a material exploration as opposed to coming from the building in the other direction? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, in, in Ghana, 2% of our population can afford an architect. <laughs> so 90% yeah. uh, of most of the global south is built, you know, by self-build um, enterprises or the individual. Um, and so code all of these regulations has very little impact on actually the built fabric. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, in some ways the bottom up has been a way of thinking about materials in a much larger systems perspective. Um, and, and sort of going back to that diagram, you know, in every material there's, there's a politics, there's an economy of who plays what where. Um, and so, kind of looking for where alienated value, whether that's in the labor system, whether that's in the ecology, whether it's on the site itself, has always been a sort of an, an important starting point. Um, and I, I think a lot about, you know, new forms of community, um, you know, sort of decision making and action um, development frameworks, what really allows people to have agency access and voice to, to contributing change. Mm. And that's, um, you know, particularly in agriculture and, and um, the transformation of some of these materials into the building, it's in cooperatives, um, in urban environments. There are a range of, of groups I'm very curious to, to also hear about, you know, the federal, municipal, community scale, the individual scale, mechanisms that allow you to develop different values for every single choice you make, whether it's about the material or, you know, some larger scale um, infrastructure. How do you translate something like um, a material as being uh, a common good, a public common good? Um, yeah. And so that and, 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 this does this, 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 and this, and that might offset some of the costs for the individual um, and make it feasible um, for the, the larger community. So I'm very curious, Alex, to hear you know some of these um, models for development and, and relationships between stakeholders that you know you've. Then the perspective of the material itself, almost in a, is beginning to emerge here. This sense of um, Indy, Indy Johar talked about this yesterday. The sense that you know rivers are beginning to have rights in a sense, and there is questionable anthropomorphization of uh, an ecosystem in that way, giving it a legal right as if it's a human, which wouldn't wouldn't really make sense in another lens, but is also kind of a step which is a section of the Yarra River here. And the Buran Council, which has emerged around that, which is a council as in a governance entity for the river itself. So it sits across a range of other municipal boundaries and it has state backing and some legislative status. And it begins to suggest that we organize decision making at the scale of the ecosystem as opposed to the completely arbitrary scale of the city of Yarrow versus the city of Melbourne and so on. So this Buran Council can, in a sense, speak for the, the rights of the river as, as it's with its own materiality. Um, how are you sort of beginning to relate to that and then the work, the very material work that you're doing on the ground or in the water around that place? Uh, yeah, I think that this is a very interesting area of discussion, I think, and that idea um, really that you're bringing up about um, you know, defining a common good that wasn't necessarily perceived that way originally. I, I, do, I do think that exists in communities um, across the world. And I mean, I'm working on the resilience plan for Greenwich, Connecticut right now, which is mm. one of the, well, the highest real estate in all of that area. And, um, and there are locations like this there. And, mm. and uh, 
and it's interesting to see the, the, um, the attitude even within a wealthy community versus the attitude in the less wealthy community. Um, the only example of a, a buyout program in Connecticut happened in West Haven, and it was mostly houses that were rented, that were rental properties that were, had been flooded multiple times. They were built right adjacent to a wetland system that floods. And, um, and the town had to go out door to door to um, communicate and convince essentially a cluster of housing in order to attract funding through FEMA to support it. And it's, it's a very difficult uh, task, and there's only one example in, in Connecticut, other than other examples where houses were blown out because of big events, which is the post-disaster um, post response, which is a critical time, which mostly developers take advantage of. Uh, towns don't have the resources typically to do buyouts at that moment, which would be a great time to do it. Um, they're trying to work on those kinds of things now, so there's a sort of lag time. Um, I think with the beer room, uh, which I'm, uh, and I'm fitting into, I guess, this momentum that's built in Melbourne around um, around recognition of uh, of indigenous uh, sovereignty and uh, and and starting to understand some of the um, the the negative things that have happened over time with that with that with the in relation between um, you know uh, the colonizer and um, and in a sense the beer room. Is, is, is the Yarra River. The Birung is the name for the Yarra River. So, uh, and the Birung Council was formed to be the voice of the river. And there is an effort to, to define a legal, to find the river as a legal entity, although it hasn't happened yet, but there is work towards that, partly because then you can, um, then you can actually uh, sue and you can, the, the river itself can start to become, um, have identity within the legal structure of society. But uh, the Birung Council, one of the important things about the Birung Council is it's bicultural. So there's rep bicultural representation, which I think is absolutely critical. And that's how we framed the studio that we've been teaching Design This Country, is through this bicultural representation. And um, there's one or more students in the, in the room here that have been um, in the past. Um, it's really an effort. There, the, one of the big challenges here, I think, is that there's not enough capacity to represent the, uh, the um, indigenous perspective and to also work at the scales that would have an impact um, you know, on this. And, and to, you know, because basically, uh, uh, indigenous groups and traditional owners are spread very thin uh, and have incredible demands on their time. And, and so trying to sort of make this transition <clears throat> that's quite, it, it, that it's kind of, there's momentum in society, but there, the capacity needs to be developed. For, for supply is 70% of the drinking water for uh, Melbourne. And so there's a lot that is taken for granted in terms of the functionality and health of the river system. And basically in terms of <clears throat> collective thinking, uh, we're, the way I'm working about on it now is I'm, I am trying to think about it through the design lens. How can we reconsider or reposition the Birung as, as a fundamental part of this city? Mm. Uh, uh, when, uh, people, when you talk to um, folks who've been around for a long time, that everyone says, we turned our back on the river. That's like the statement here in Melbourne. We turned our back on the river. There's a lot of development right up to the river. There have been um, a lot, large portions of the floodplain have been disconnected from the river, and the um, the dam that was built and other activities have reduced the flow by f over 50 percent. So the uh, tr historic flooding dynamics and the sort of um, pulsing of uh, the floodplain isn't isn't really occurring at the level that it once was. So there's major disruptions to the health of the ecosystems. Now that we've urbanized, the question is, can we reconsider um, critical components of the river system? So what we're doing is starting with the, uh, the confluences. We're looking at the, um, where the tributaries intersect with the river as critical places. Part of it is that um, for, for many indigenous um, mobs, those locations were meeting grounds, and they were really important culturally. Uh, and there's issues with access. A lot mm. of them are privately owned. The university owns, happens to own the Darabin, where the Darabin hits the Yara. And so we're focusing on that as one location where there's, and, and we're coordinating with Melbourne Water to look at uh, reconstructing floodplain using stormwater instead of river water. Uh, and so that, and the idea is um, we're working towards a co uh, generation of these with the Wurundji Woiwurrung, with the, the notion of a long term goal within the university to move towards a land back model, building on custodianship as a a custodianship of land as a framework for um, for rethinking the vision, but building on what you're what I think you're, um, you're talking about, which, is, which I think is so critical, not just you know breaking out of the status quo and reinventing the way that we approach design yeah. and, and relationships to land and built materials. Yeah. And I think, so yeah, I think that. So then moving from the tributaries, looking at the billabongs, looking at the um, at the. Uh, 
that, that expanding out until you eventually get to the catchment. And so one big idea is, can sub-basin watershed neighbors work collectively to actually improve the water quality and improve, improve what's flowing into the river? Because the whole, all of the people living in the upland catchments are actually have a responsibility and a role in the quality and health of the river. Mm. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So um, thank you, Alex. That's fascinating. I think the, I'm going to, I'm aware of the time, the last hour, hour and a bit or what you saw yesterday or the day before. I know you also had a tour with um, Uncle Dave Wandin, who took you around um, Dyke Falls, which is kind of in the area that Alex was talking about, well, it is in the area. Um, so that I know that was a, an experience <laughs> in the best sense. Um, and then yesterday we had the whole day, and then you've had this conversation this morning with some of uh, our colleagues here from multiple angles on these questions. So. You have a mic in your hand, Maylene. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to drop the mic and pass it to <laughs> Joseph. Would you like just to? You don't have to sum anything up, but what's on your mind at this point as a kind of a closing thought? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's my first time in Melbourne um, for I think the last time I was here was 2004, and it was so brief that I can't really say that I've been to Melbourne before. So. It's really um, been an incredibly intense process of acclimatization and of um, really uh, taking stock of a reality that is fundamentally different from the reality that I live in and that I'm accustomed to operating in. Um, and that is um, where you really see a series of forces uh, pushing and pulling and kind of negotiating for, um, uh, for space that in a way is a microcosm, I think, of forces that are uh, operating at the planetary scale to raise some incredibly urgent questions. And normally, I think in, in Europe, we're very, um, the, the sort of the, the manifestation, the, 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 of these questions seems very remote. It's, um, mm. it's, it's difficult to see that kind of really reflected in the landscape around you, the way that Alex just described, for example. Um, whereas here in Melbourne, it's tangible, it's, it's palpable. You really, it's, it's something you can simply walking down the street with someone like Uncle Dave Wand, and um, you can really put your hand on it. And I think that's an incredible um, opportunity for the city. It seems like uh, uh, being here in the university that that's an opportunity that's being taken as a, a sort of a, a global forum, um, really, for. Um, thinking about a different approach to design um, and a different approach to um, the production of, um, of culture. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, mm. it, it's, it's very inspiring to see. It's mm. all still something that I think I, I'm gonna, it's gonna take some time to uh, allow it to settle and to metabolize it and to really understand, um, if I ever do understand the, um, what I've seen in these days, but uh, it's been incredibly inspiring. Oh, thank you, thank you. And well, just email me the answer when it when it <laughs> when it pops out of your metabolism. <laughs> Don't hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, and Mei Ling. Yeah, I mean, I think the one thing that um, has really come through. I mean, we we did go on this this four hour walk with Uncle Dan, and we we barely moved. Uh, you know. Mm much but there was just so much in that small space that was uh, being communicated there was a way of reading ecology and our role in it that was to me really profound uh, that you know when you're talking about your health it's not separate from the health of the ecosystem just as you know when you're designing a building that cannot be you know taken in isolation it's part of and when you see a clean river it's because there's fantastic design and there's a fantastic understanding of how we impact the quality of, of life around us and vice versa. So that's something I, I think I'm going to be taking back in a, in a very tangible way. Mm. Um, and, you know, Uncle Dan, everything that was either not doing well or doing well, he read as something else, you know, the, 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 the drivers that, that caused that whether it was climate or the absence of a certain species or the color of a certain leaf. I mean, yeah. there's a way of reading ecology that I yeah. think we've completely lost. Um, and I think as architects, we've got to figure out how to start, you know, reconstructing a, um, a material understanding, an ecological understanding um, in order to decarbonize. We, we can't do that without that, you know, that, that found foundational knowledge. Um, yeah. 
So it's really wonderful to, to have been here and I wish I was staying longer, given now I'm just adjusting to the time situation. <laughs> but, um, you can yeah. come back, it's fine. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you so much. And um, it's been a great privilege having you both here. So thanks so much for your time, your energy, and your intellect and enthusiasm for this. And, and that reframing you both did at the end there is super inspiring, I think, to us, because with my colleagues like uh, Don Bates and Ellen Frischot and others here who lead the design and architecture um, across the faculty, we're figuring out how design and architecture works in the 21st century for the 21st century and the possibility of Melbourne as a place where, as you both pointed out, we have fires and floods and at the same time as 67,000 years of knowledge of how to deal with those things. So it's, it's all of these things happening simultaneously here, sort of global north in the global south and west in the far east. I mean, it's, it's an incredibly complex set of um, conditions here. And that's, that's why we're so excited to do this, have this kind of conversation in this kind of school. So yeah. thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, without any further ado, I think I'll draw it to a close there. So I'd just like to, well, uh, thank you once again and join for you to join me in thanking our colleagues, Joseph Grima, Mailing Loco, Alex Felsen, Anoma Pieres, Gioti Schuckler, and Patrick Kobana. Thank you very much.